Introduction and Chapter One of Physiology of the Opera. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Marianne Spiegel. Physiology of the Opera by John H. Swaby, A.K.A. Screechy. I both compose and perform, sir, and though I say it. Perhaps few even of the profession possess the contrapunta and the chromatic better. Connoisseur, number 130. I see, sir, you have got a travelled air, which shows you one to whom the opera is by no means new. Byron. Introduction. As an introduction to the dissertation upon which we are about to enter, such an antiquarian view of the subject might be taken as would tend to establish a parallel between the ancient greek tragedy and the modern sanguinary italian opera the strong resemblance therein being displayed of signor salvi trilling on the stage to the immortal thespis jargoning from a dung-cart but we shall indulge in no such wearying pedantry our intention being merely to hold the mirror up to nature in presenting our immaterial reflector to the public we invite our readers to a view of the present only a period of time in which they take most interest since they adorn it with their own presence we feel satisfied that few of the ladies who take a peep into this mirror will find any cause to break it in a fit of petulancy after having looked upon the attractive reflection of their own lovely features few young gentlemen will throw down a glass that gives them a just idea of their striking and distant appearance behind a large moustache and a gilded lorgnette old papas who rule change and keep a stall cannot be offended with that which teaches them how dignified and creditable is their position as they sit up proudly and exhibit their family's extravagance and ostentation as an evidence of the stability of their commercial relations few mammas will carp at a book which assures them that society does not esteem them less highly because they use an opera box as a sort of matrimonial show window in which they place their beautiful daughters got up regardless of expense as delicate wares in the market of hymen in these our humble efforts to present to our readers an amusing yet faithful picture of the opera we hope our manner of treating the subject has been to nothing extenuate nor aught set down in malice this book has not for its end the ultimate censure of foreign opera singers or native opera goers we do not therefore expect to gratify the malignant demands of persons of overstrained morality who maintain that the opera is a bad school of musical science or a worse school of morals and exclaim with the very correct mr coleridge who was shocked in a concert room nor cold nor stern my soul yet i detest these scented rooms where to a gaudy throng heaves the proud harlot in her distended breast in intricacies of laborious song these feel not music's genuine power nor deign to melt at nature's passion warbled plaint but when the long-breathed singer's uptrilled strain bursts in a squall they gape for wonderment nor do we coincide in sentiment with those who conceiving that every folly and absurdity sanctioned by fashion is converted into reason and common sense believe that the whole duty of man consists in spending the day with max Moretzek on the occasion of his musical jubilees and being roasted by gas in the hours of broad daylight consequently the reader will find no one line herein written with the intention of flattering the vanity of those who ride to the opera every night in a splendid coach followed by spotted dogs having thus declared the impartial manner in which it is our purpose to pursue the physiological discussion of our subject and the various phenomena involved in its consideration we proceed at once to unveil the operatic existence to the reader fatigued no doubt by an introductory salam already protracted beyond the limits of propriety chapter one le pro toujours fait à ma veille on y voile et suer brochet les oreilles Beringer. to most of the world and we say it advisedly the opera is a sealed book 
we do not mean a bare representation with its accompanying screechings violinings and bass drummings everybody has seen that but the race of beings who constitute that remarkable combination their feelings positions social habits their relation to one another what they say and eat footnote we actually knew a man who when a tenor was spoken of as having gone through his role thought that the worthy had been eating his breakfast End footnote. whether the tenor ever notices as they the world do the fine legs of the contralto in man's dress and whether the basso drinks pale ale or porter all these things have been hitherto wrapped in an inscrutable mystery in regard to mere actors not singers this feeling is confined to children but the operators of an opera are essentially esoteric they are enclosed by a curtain more impenetrable than the chinese wall you may walk all around them nay you may even know an inferior artiste but there is a line beyond which even the fast men with all their impetuosity are restrained from invading you walk in the street with a young female on whom you flatter yourself you are making an impression suddenly she cries out oh there's bolini do look dear creature isn't he you may as well turn round and go home immediately the rest of your walk won't be worth half the dream you had the night before this shows an importance to be attached to these remarkable persons which together with the mystery which encircles them is exceedingly aggravating to the feelings of a large body of respectable citizens among those who are mostly afflicted we may mention all women but most especially boarding-school misses mothers of families are much perturbed they wonder why the tenor is so intimate with the donna considering they are not married and fathers of families wonder where under the sun that manager gets the money to pay a tenor twelve hundred dollars a month when state sixes are so shockingly depressed we were going to enumerate those we thought particularly afflicted by a praiseworthy desire to know something more of these obscurities but they are too many for us in every class of society nay in the breast of almost every person there exists a desire to be rightly informed on these subjects it was to supply this want that we have devoted ourselves more especially to the actors who do to the exclusion of the auditors who are done shakespeare observes that all the world's a stage the converse of this proposition is no less worthy of being regarded as a great moral truth that all the stage is a world every condition of life may be found typified in one or the other of the officials or attaches of an opera house from the king upon the throne symbolized by the haughty and magisterial impresario to the chevonier in the gutter represented by the unfortunate chorister who is attired as a shabby nobleman on the stage but who goes home to a supper of leeks between these two degrees of dignity and unimportance come those many shades of social position corresponding to the happy situations of secretary of state secretary of the treasury and divers other dignitaries set forth in the stage director the treasurer the chorus master etc the tenor basso prima donna and baritone may be considered as belonging to what is called society that well-to-do and ornamental portion of the community who having no vocation save to frequent balls soirees concerts and operas and fall in love serve as objects of admiration to those persons less favored by fortune who make the clothes and dress the hair of the former class our simile need not be carried further it being apparent to the most inconsiderate reader that it is quite as truthful as that hatched by the swan of avon we shall now commence our observations upon the most interesting members of a troop those best known to the community before whom they nightly appear and leave unnoticed those disagreeable but influential ones who raise the price of tickets or stand in a little box near the door and palm off all the back seats upon the uninitiated end of chapter one chapter two of physiology of the opera by screechy this librivox recording is in the public domain read by marianne chapter two in short i may i am sure with truth assert that whether in the allegro or in the piano the adagio the largo or the forte he never had his equal connoisseur number one hundred and thirty 
famed for the even tenor of his conduct, and his conduct as a tenor. Knickerbocker The tenor is a small man, seldom exceeding the medium height. His voice is, comparatively speaking, a small voice, and consequently not likely to issue from overgrown lungs. His proportions are, or at least ought to be, as symmetrical as possible. His hair, nine times out of ten, is black, and always curls. His beard is reasonably bushy, but his moustache is the most artistically cultivated and carefully nurtured collection of hair that ever adorned the superior lip of man. His features are likely to be handsome, sometimes, however, effeminately so. His dress is a little extravagant, not extravagant in the mode and manner of a fast man or a dandy, for it is not punctiliously fashionable like that of the latter, without any deviation from Taylor's plates. Neither does it resemble that of the former in the gentlemanly roughness of its appearance. Consequently he rejoices not in entire suits of grey or plaid, those very sporting coats, those English country gentlemen's shoes, those amply bowed cravats, and those shirts that are so resplendent with the well-executed heads of terrier dogs. No! The primo tenora has a passion, first, for satin, secondly, for jewellery, and lastly, for hats, boots, and gloves. He dotes on satin scarves, cravats, and ties, and his gorgeous satin vests, of all the hues of the rainbow, astound the saunterer on the morning promenade. His love for pins, studs, rings, and chains is almost enough to lead us to believe that his blood is mingled with that of the Mohawks. Boots that fit like gloves, and gloves that fit like the skin, render him the envy of dandies. His hat is smooth and glossy to an excess, and its peculiar formation makes it considered un peu trop fort, even by the most daring of hat fanciers. The tenor rises late, partly because he is naturally indolent, partly because the prime basso drank him slightly exhilarated the evening previous, and partly out of affectation and the desire to appear a very fine gentleman. Having spent a long time in making a negligé toilette, he orders his breakfast. Seated in his comprehensive armchair, and attired in all the splendour of a well-tinseled satin or velvet quelote, a dazzling robe de chambre, and slippers of the most brilliant colours, he takes his matutinal repast. And now we begin to discover some of the thousand vexations and annoyances that harass the life of this poor object of popular support. His breakfast is but the skeleton of that useful and nourishing repast. No rich beefsteaks, no tender chops, no fragrant ham nor well-seasoned omelettes transfer their nutritive properties through his system. Any indulgence in these wholesome articles of food is considered direct destruction to the tender organ of the tenor. A hunting breakfast every day, or a glass of wine at an improper hour, if persisted in for any length of time, it is supposed would ruin the most delightful voice that ever sung an aria. A large cup of café au lait, with an egg beaten in it, is all the morning meal of which the poor artiste, as he styles himself, is permitted to partake. This feat accomplished, he takes up the newspaper in which he spells out the puff which he paid the reporter to insert, and after satisfying himself that he has received his quid pro quo, he lounges away the morning until a sufficient space of time has elapsed to render the use of the voice no longer deleterious, as it is immediately after eating. And then come two or three hours of study that is no trifle. The tenor is a man, and it seems to be a great moral law that whether it come in the form of labor, disease, and wa or indigestion, suffering shall be the badge of all our tribe. Even prima donnas, who defy gods and men with more temerity than all living creatures, are constrained to concede the obligation of this universal moral edict. The tenor then yields homage to human nature and the public, in the labor of climbing stubborn scales, rehearsing new operas, and sometimes, though not often, in receiving the impertinence of arrogant prima donnas during several hours every day. After these fatiguing efforts, he makes his grand toilette and prepares himself to astound the town no less by his personal attractions than by his song. 
the chief promenade of the city where he condescends to mete out to highly favored audiences the treasures of his organ is made the day theater of his glory accompanied by his friend the primo basso he saunters along very quietly attracting the gaze of the curious and calling forth the passionate remarks of enthusiastic young ladies who feel it would be a pleasure to die if only they could leave such a gentleman behind on earth to sing to chi adio in the event of their being snatched away in beauty's bloom the basso is the chosen male companion of the tenor's walk firstly because he is no rival and secondly because the gross physical endowments of the former are such as to bring out the latter's symmetrical proportions in such strong relief sometimes the tenor is seen riding out with a prima donna with whom he is nearly always a favorite he is the gentleman who makes himself useful in assisting her to destroy time he performs for her those thousand and one little delicate attentions for which all women are so truly grateful and then he sings with her every night those sentimental duos that necessarily produce their effect upon the feminine bosom whether walking with his gigantic friend or riding with his fair one the tenor behaves himself with the greatest propriety and gentlemanlike bearing excepting always a certain air which leads us to believe that he thinks too curious old port of himself he is more grave but apparently more vain when on foot than when seated in the carriage with the prima donna at which time his gesticulation becomes very animated sometimes very extravagant though we must always accord it the attraction of gracefulness the time is thus agreeably walked ridden and chaffed away until the hour for the substantial dinner comes to fortify mankind against the slings and arrows of hunger and tedium then the tenor does dare to partake of a few of what are technically called the delicacies of the season but still a restraint is put upon the appetite for in a few hours more he must go through labors for which the fullness of satiety would little prepare him a very worthy and elderly clergyman of the church of england once made known to the writer his opinion concerning after-dinner sermons in the following words i believe sir that those sermons preached through the medium of simple roast beef and plum pudding may have been sermons invented by inspiration they are sure to be enunciated through the agency of the devil so melting strains of solos and duos when sung through the medium of soups pates and fricassees lose their liquidity and film mantle and stagnate into monotony how the tenor is occupied until the hour of supper we shall relate in another chapter suffice it to say that he is at home that is to say on the stage but when supper comes he is no longer prevented by fear of lost voice or any other dire calamity from giving way to the cravings of hunger and thirst he eats with the relish of hunger induced by labor and drinks with the excitement arising from the consciousness that he is what in the language of the turf is styled the favorite the ladies and gentlemen of the troop usually assemble at supper and it is then that the tenor bestows his gallantries on the prima donna and says many more really complimentary things than are to be found set down in his professional role in concluding this sketch of the tenor the writer would with all due submission to the opinion of the public venture to discover his sentiments upon a question which often agitates society viz whether the tenor is always sick when he announces himself to be seriously indisposed the writer hopes he will not render himself liable to the charge of duplicity or an attempt at evasion when he declares it to be his impression that on the occasion of such announcements the tenor is sometimes seriously indisposed but not always the tenor as we have before observed is but a man and must needs be subject to diseases like other men but when we consider the delicacy of his conformation we must multiply the chances of his liability to indisposition his organization is such that the most trifling irregularity in his general health operates immediately upon the voice now for the tenor in the slightest degree out of tone to appear before a merciless audience consisting of blase opera-goers tyrannical critics hired depreciators and unrelenting musical amateurs would indicate the most utter folly and imbecility the tenor is well aware that a reputation for singing divinely a few nights in the year is more lucrative than a reputation for ability to sing tolerably well taking advantage of all the nights in the space of time 
it is consequently more advantageous for him to sing occasionally when he feels his voice to be in full force and vigour and his spirits in a sufficiently animated condition to warrant his appearing with every certainty of success when therefore he does not favour the public with the melody of his notes it is generally speaking because without really suffering from a serious attack of disease he considers that his appearance would ensure a future diminution in the offers of the impresario hence the affiche usually proclaim nothing but truth itself when they declare that the tenor is seriously indisposed but then we must be careful to interpret the word indisposition by that one of its significations which is equivalent to disinclination that some compulsory measures might be taken to make these gentlemen who can sing but won't sing more complying and willing to yield to the wishes and requests of managers and audiences the writer has never entertained a doubt the ways and means of effecting such an object he will not take upon himself to devise or advise but will merely state a fact which probably may induce some one to enter upon a thorough examination of the subject and suggest the remedy upon one occasion when the havana troupe was performing in philadelphia and a favorite tenor had been amusing himself by trifling with the public until the patience of that forbearing portion of mankind was entirely exhausted the treasury was beginning to fall extremely low and the wearied out director was well nigh driven to desperation in this critical juncture of affairs the gentleman who was the legal adviser of the troop was applied to to say whether there was not some compulsory process known to the law by which the refractory tenor could be brought to a recognition of the right of the rest of the company to the use of his voice to attract large audiences and thereby replenish the empty coffers of the treasury upon answer that there existed no such process the distracted director muttered a few maledictions upon our country with a sneer at our free institutions and informed the astonished counsellor that in havana when the tenor was supposed to be feigning sickness the proper authorities were resorted to for the right of examination of the offending party by a physician and a certificate of the state of his health upon the physician certifying that the signer was able to go through his role a few gendarmes were dispatched to seize the delinquent and take such means as would sooner coerce him into a compliance with the stipulations of his professional contract every reasonable excuse however should be made for the necessity the tenor is under to be careful of the delicate organ whereby he gains his subsistence when we reflect how many of these poor fellows lose their voices and are consequently driven to throw themselves on the cold charity of the public or out of the window we must be struck with the inhumanity which would be exercised if the professional singer were excluded from enjoying occasionally by permission what every clergyman in the land can always claim as a right the disease which the hibernian servant expressively denominated the brown gaiters in the throat end of chapter two chapter three of physiology of the opera by screechy this librivox recording is in the public domain read by marianne chapter three and for the bass the beast can only bellow an ignorant noteless timeless tuneless fellow byron the primo basso is to the primo tenora what the draught horse is to the racer drawing along the heavy business of an opera whilst the other goes capering and curvetting through whole pages of chromatics and runs bounding with unerring precision over the most fearful musical intervals the basso consequently to uphold the vast superstructure of song must be a man furnished with a strong supporting and sustaining voice he usually plays the part of tyrants either of the domestic circle or of the throne and the tyrants of fiction always have been represented as overgrown individuals from the time of the titans down to the giants who meet with their well-merited fate from the invincible arm of that doughty nursery hero jack the giant killer it is a most fortunate circumstance then for the basso that while his powerful voice must necessarily proceed from gigantic lungs and those organs again are chiefly found planted in largely developed frames his huge proportions only the better qualify him for his department of operatic personae his form is heavy and would be muscular if ease and indolence unrestrained appetite 
and no more exertion than is requisite to blow the bass bellows during half a dozen evenings in the week did not permit an undue accumulation of adipose substance his hair is generally black but not of that rich glossy curling kind which decks the fair brow of the delicate little tenor his features are gross and sensual exhibiting about the amount of intelligence which may be looked for in one of those bedecked and garlanded animals whose appearance among us announces the future sale of show beef his dress is an exhibition of slovenly grandeur each article of clothing is in itself very handsome perhaps very gaudy but the manner in which it is dragged on the figure makes the two ensemble coarse and common slovenly and disagreeable his animal propensities hold the intellectual faculties in bondage and every approach to sentiment is excluded by the clogged up avenues to thought his manner of living is sans et en action his life is an existence tossed and troubled by the vicissitudes of sleeping and feeding with occasional interruptions of mechanical vocalization he possesses an organ which it is supposed cannot be impaired by indulgence in the pleasures of the table and he always acts as if he wished to put this supposition to the test when he orders his breakfast therefore he does not look down the cart in order to see what viands he must avoid but only to ascertain how many dishes are likely to be objects agreeable to his palate substantials form all his meals no mild cafe au lait composes the meal which is to announce that he has commenced his daily labors of masticulation after a morning's deglutition worthy of the anaconda he suffers digestion to prepare him for a walk while he indulges in piles of cigars as this smoking effort is a long one he is about ready to join his elegant friend the tenor when the latter calls on him to go out and astound the town what a majestic stride the heavy beefy fellow puts on as he saunters down the street his body seems to say for his face is void of expression how his body seems to say gentlemen you are all very well but it won't do i outweigh a dozen of you and the ladies have to surrender to such a superior weight of metal the basso seldom loves the prima donna he regards her as a very troublesome lady who devils him at rehearsals because he won't sing in time on the stage because she wants to show her importance and in the salon because she requires so much attention the only wonder is how he and the delicate sensitive tenor persons presenting such a decided contrast to each other should live together on terms of such apparent friendship the reason however is that the association is not one arising from choice but from necessity between the tenor and the baritone there is something too much of similarity in voice and physique to render them just the most inseparable friends in the world but in the vast musical gulf between the tenor and the basso all professional rivalry is buried end of chapter three chapter four of the physiology of the opera by screechy this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 4 Your female singer being exceedingly capricious and wayward, and very liable to accident. A sketchbook. Everybody knows what a prima donna is. She is the first lady, and this is a fact apparently better known to the individual herself than to anybody else. At least her actions would warrant this inference she deems herself more indispensable to an opera than an executioner to an execution or the thimbles to a thimble rig man she takes no pains to conceal what a high price she sets on the value of her presence she sings just when she pleases and just as she pleases caprice itself is not more capricious than this fair creature as capricious as a prima donna has almost become a proverb and we predict that in a few years it will become fully established as such she is a female tyrant impresario treasurer chef d'orchestre chorus master and chorus tremble before her when in one of her passions she brings down her petty little foot in a most commanding stamp she gives the first mentioned person more trouble than all the singers orchestra and officials together with her coughs colds and affected indispositions next to the impresario 
the chez d'orchestre suffers most from her imperious spirit he never conducts so as to accompany her properly and though she sings a half note higher than she did at rehearsal she expects every poor musician to transpose his magic at sight or receive the indications of her displeasure in a way that leads the audience to believe that the fault lies entirely with the orchestra she worries the basso poor heavy drowsy fellow because he's such a slow coach and such an oaf she is disposed to be more friendly to the tenor who is the only person who receives any tokens of her good will but in truth she would cease to be a woman if she were unkind to this gentlemanly polite little fellow nor does she hold the public in the least regard but conceives that she has a right to be seriously indisposed as often as she thinks that people are really desirous to hear her and is subject when the house is thin to cold as byron says she keeps all the town who have determined to go and hear her in the most provoking suspense balls and evening parties are sadly interrupted by her erratic course for she is sure to sing on the evenings assigned to those delightfully laborious modes of destroying time all the pleasure-promising engagements made by the browns and the smiths to form a party and go in concert to the opera are postponed from time to time to the great vexation of young harry brown who craftily set the affair on foot in order to have an evening's chaff with miss julia smith sometimes the prima donna's serious indisposition is not discovered by the fair singer herself until the ladies of the audience have removed the cloaks furs and hoods which guard their loveliness from the cold of a winter night until the young gentlemen have jammed their opera hats into an inconceivably small space and adroitly passed the hand up the collar and cravat to discover how things are in that quarter and until the old habitues have settled themselves down into the softest chair of the pit with the full intention of being extremely displeased and making very unfavorable comparisons between the performance about to take place and one at which they were present some twenty years before however she is a splendid creature a small miracle in the way of humanity and can therefore be excused from pursuing that monotonous and regular course of life which patient merit is obliged to take she is either a beautiful woman in reality or one who can get up such an admirable imitation that it is difficult to distinguish it from the genuine she is well skilled in music at least in its execution but she is always much more deeply versed in the virtues of cosmetics and the art of making herself beautiful there are two varieties in the figure of the prima donna either firstly such as to qualify her for opera buffa and certain tragic roles in which case she is of a medium stature delicate proportions and possesses the most graceful and vivacious action prima donnas of this stamp make the dearest sweetest most innocent-looking aminas the most sprightly coquettish rosinas and the most faithful confiding and sincere lucias or secondly she is of a large mould more masculine dimensions with a countenance that can gather up in a moment a show of the requisite amount of fury to poignard the husband and strangle the babies she plays all the high tragedy roles doing the semiramida norma and lucrezia with a very sanguinary power and effect those of the first kind are most admired by the gay young fellows about the town who have no taste for music and who do not resort to the opera to hear it but make the parquette a lounging place where they can be in the mode see beautiful women and show themselves the prima donna in her attempts to render herself personally attractive has an auxiliary in her maid who is a compound of companion and servant and a coiffeuse gifted with the most delicate taste and artistic execution how often we have looked round the house and been forced to confess that the prima donna was literally the first lady in the building in respect to costume and coiffure this maid too is almost as much of a curiosity among maids as her mistress among fine ladies she may be regarded as a prima donna without a voice without fine clothes bouquets and a tenor companion and it is her destiny to marry one of the violinists when her mistress marries the tenor it is upon this official that the duty of attending to the prima donna's lapdogs beatrice and amore particularly devolves two animals that are almost as dear to their possessor as her professional reputation in addition to these darling little quadrupeds upon which so many caresses are bestowed both by the faultless hand of the mistress and the same well-diamond member of the tenor a parrot usually divides the affections of one who womanlike must love something 
but who has been so far initiated into the ways of the world as to doubt the sincerity of all mankind except probably that of the aforesaid tenor we remember once being present when a well-known prima donna was about to leave a northern city where a rival cantatrice had lately appeared and was inducing comparisons unsatisfactory to the former she had been informed that an overland trip to new orleans would be greatly encumbered by the presence of her lapdogs and parrot and was prevailed upon to bestow them on some tender-hearted persons whose extreme affection for domesticated animals would be a guarantee for their gentle treatment a married gentleman we are afraid without having consulted his wife kindly offered to relieve the lady from all trouble in finding the suitable persons by taking them himself assuming the attitude of norma handing over babes she delivered up the poodles with what sadness were the little creatures confided to his care what admonitions and instructions to carefully keep them what prayers for their faithful protection a womanly tear bedewed the cheek of the fascinating lady and a smile followed as if to ask forgiveness for what she feared those present might consider an unbecoming weakness five years afterwards we saw in a concert room this same sensitive creature who was so moved and affected at the denier adieu paid to her hateful little poodles scowled darkly bite her lips and turn her back on the person who had engaged her whom by the by we in common with the audience regarded as a much aggrieved individual between the attention and affection bestowed on her pets some hours devoted to study and rehearsal occasional rides and walks and time spent in the pleasing avocation of arranging her wardrobe and in innocently admiring her fair self in the mirror the days of this spoiled child of the music-loving are wild away she is acquainted with some of the dandies of the place where she for the time resides but as such gentlemen in this country seldom have the temerity to appear with her in public their usefulness as escort promenaders is greatly abridged the fast men sometimes smuggle themselves into her visiting circle in order to be able to boast of their intimacy with the prima donna but as this class of society is seldom very fluent in the use of italian and as there is small affinity between the sentimentality of the opera and mile heats to harness this acquaintance is not of very long duration the necessity of personal beauty in a prima donna is such that she must assume that virtue if she have it not not many winters since a beautiful cantatrice was induced to undertake the role of romeo in i montecchi ed i capuletti the lady was excellently proportioned except that there existed a great want of symmetry in the inferior members and as romeo's skirts must necessarily be short and the lady could not at will assume a pair of well-turned knees and calves she clothed the offending limbs in what at this day would be called bloomer pantaloons the attempt to ingraft turkish trousers on the veronese costume proved too absurd to warrant the continuance of such representation and was abandoned after the night of its introduction the effect of a prima donna on society is very various if she be of the high tragic or strangulation school it is to induce young ladies of some voice and a good deal of person to clothe themselves in white tulle on the occasion of evening parties and amateur concerts draw their hair very smoothly over their temples drive a white camilla into the left side of the head and sing long recitatives from norma or lucrezia in the case of evening parties to the infinite chagrin of young gentlemen possessed of great waltzing powers and passions and in the case of amateur concerts to the fatigue of yawning audiences if the prima donna is of the coquettish school of song every damsel of sylph-like portions vivacious expression and a turn from man-killing chirps and warbles away at the sprightly passages of the barbieri as for the male part of the community it is perfectly easy to divine how they will be affected by the appearance of the different prima donna who from year to year present themselves for musical honors they will always be pleased but chiefly by those who are rather attractive in features than in voice the very young and inexperienced men just entering into society denominated cubs by the bow of some years standing affect most the prima donna of the sanguinary school because she seems more in accordance with the ideas they have derived from the study of media a work to which they have not long since bid adieu they regard the killing of babes as the most tragic of tragedy 
and the actress who can do the thing best as the most accomplished of actresses but the knowing fellows of mature years prefer the pretty creatures who look so fond and affectionate in their short peasant dresses displaying the delicate little foot and well-turned ankle how they gather night after night into the parquette to compare opinions on the merits of orsini's soft notes and the long beautifully filled stockings of the page dress we once heard an enthusiastic cuban remark when patty was singing orsini to parodi's lucrezia parodi is the finest singer i ever heard she is the best actress i ever saw some few people can appreciate her singing many more her acting but patty's legs ah sir that is something that everybody can understand how delighted the young fellows pretend to be with the wild bacchanal song when in reality they only encore the songstress in order to have another opportunity of admiring her pretty knees alas how foolish they are to throw away admiration on one who takes no more thought of them than if they never existed but each one of them supposes that she must necessarily be slightly enamoured of himself the consequence is that next morning divers bouquets with small notes or cards containing a few amatory words appended to them are handed in to the servant who is very much out of humour at what has become troublesome from its over repetition the old habitues of course will not be affected in any way except by peevishness and petulance which will drive them to their usual course of distraction ah says old twaddle pasta you should have seen pasta no melodramatic twaddle about her genuine artistic delineation of passion and profound emotion and then what a voice none of your ambiguous voices there no difficulty in pronouncing whether soprano or contralto and then her beauty none of your namby-pamby sickly insignificant prettiness and thus twaddle grumbles on making shocking comparisons between the past and the present poor old twaddle he has according to his own showing outlived all that is good in the province of music the prima donna in this country will generally speaking produce on any foreigner who happens to be among us an effect very much akin to that exercised upon twaddle she will set him sighing after the vocalization of the other side of the atlantic he will seem to forget that parody or the haze ought to sing as well in this country as in europe but still he can't be brought to that belief and what is worse upon your venturing to suggest any possibility of such a state of the case you are made to perceive that he considers that your nationality puts you off the bench of musical critics query why is it that every frenchman is supposed to be an infallible judge of sweet sounds for our own part we no more believe that every gallic gentleman is fit for a critic than that every one can raise a handsome moustache another effect of a beautiful prima donna is to make young husbands who have been married just two years look so steadfastly on the stage that their young wives sit with their eyes fastened on a cousin george or harry in the parquette End of chapter four chapter five of physiology of the opera by screechy this librivox recording is in the public domain read by marianne chapter five our baritone i almost had forgot in lovers parts his passion more to breathe having no heart to show he shows his teeth byron the baritone of the opera is probably the most inoffensive individual in the world this is his peculiarity even his fierceness on the stage is done with an effort and when in the course of a piece he is unfortunately called on to massacre somebody we always fancy that he does it with the most unfeigned reluctance and for aught we know with silent tears he is generally of a bashful retiring disposition and pretty nearly always awkward this perhaps arises from the anomalous position he occupies in operatical society he cannot be on good terms with the basso they have too much similarity in their voices for that he is on no more friendly relations with the tenor for the same reason besides never daring to aspire to the familiarity with the prima donna which that worthy enjoys he suffers under the affliction of conscious diffidence in their presence 
the baritone must as surely be the king as the basso must be the tyrant indeed we have often thought of the startling effect which would be produced by an opera in which this law of nature was reversed to hear the lover growling his tender feelings in a guttural e flat and moaning his hard lot in a series of double d's to listen to the remorseless tyrant ordering his mimirodons to away with him to the deepest dungeon neath the castle moat in the most soothing and mellifluous of tenor head-notes would produce such a revulsion in operatic taste as surely to create a deep sensation if nothing more chapter six there was never a man so notoriously abused twelfth night but whispering words can poison truth Coleridge. We should be much grieved were we to let a chance of immortality at our hands go by for our great friend the prompter, the suggeritore of the Italians. The prompter is to the opera what the fifth wheel is to a wagon. Everything rubs, grates, and abrades it, yet the whole concern turns on it. He is the most abused, not hated, that is reserved for the impresario, man of the company, but he does not care for it that is what he is hired for he is paid to be of a good temper and he does it he returns docility for dollars and suavity for salary he is the true philosopher just enough in the company to be part of it and sufficiently detached to avoid all the squabbles and bickerings he however is the victim of all the caprices of the company from the prima donna who in a myth kicks about his partition in a very piano cavatina to each of the bandy-legged choristers. True, he has his little revenge. This he accomplishes by using his voice too much and too loudly in the sotto voce parts, so that all the duos become trios and the quintets choruses. This is little enough to sweeten the embitterments of a suggeratore's life, but such it is, and he is contented. The suggeratore must be a thin man. It does not require a Paxson to know that a hole in the stage two feet square will not hold Barnum's obesities. He must also be short and supple-necked, to allow the green fungus which excreases from the stage to cover him, and he must be the fortunate owner of a right arm as untiring as a locomotive crank or the sails of a windmill. It is a prevalent but mistaken idea that the prompter is an impolite man, we happen to know that it is a matter of the deepest concern with him to be obliged to sit with his back to the audience. But he is like the angels and St. Cecilia. Il n'avait pas de quoi to do otherwise. Operas must be, singers must have, a lead horse. N.B. How can delicate females and tenors be expected to recollect la parole? And there he is with a little hole in the back of his calash, for the leader of the orchestra to stir him up when the excitement becomes very strong and the time is irrecoverably lost. As to the social habits of the suggeratore, the naturalist is at a loss, for he immediately disappears after rehearsal and remains in close retirement till the performance, after which he is again lost till the next day. End of chapter 6 
Chapter Eight of Physiology of the Opera by Screechy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Eight. Lord said, "My mother, what is all this story about?" A cock and a bull said York, and one of the best of its kind I ever heard. Tristram Shandy. Prince Henry, wilt thou rob this leather jerkin? crystal button knot pated agate ring puke stocking caddish garter smooth tongue spanish pouch francis o oh lord sir what do you mean prince henry why then your brown bastard is your only drink for look you francis your white canvas doublet will sully in barbary sir it cannot come to so much first part of king henry the fourth if this were played upon a stage now i would condemn it as improbable fiction twelfth night when the curtain rises the scene represents a dark forest where some quite well-dressed but desperate foreign-looking gentlemen are engaged at a game of cards which from the abandoned appearance of the players we are warranted to believe must be some such low pastime as all fours or a hand of poker the desperate gentlemen cantatorially inform the audience that their profession is that of outlaws and remark that having no particular business then to engage them they are staking quite extravagant sums on some cards which the curious observer will discover to have a very unctuous appearance how the outlaws ever came to be reduced to such straitened circumstances as to put up with these lodgings on the cold ground or how they ever fell into such an improper course of life we are not told but we remember once hearing a fast man suggest that they were evidently knobs who had overdrawn the badger by driving fast cattle and going it high the exact signification of which words we did not understand but supposed them to refer to the scions of nobility who had squandered their patrimonies in riotous living that these men are lost beyond the hope of redemption is clear from the fact that they express their determination to employ themselves in no more useful or moral way and how long they would persist in this pernicious amusement is rendered uncertain by the entrance of their leader or chieftain who it is needless to say is the tenor from the moment that the spectator casts his eye on this obviously unfortunate individual he is at once interested in his case observing to himself that if the fellow is somewhat addicted to low company still he is a very gentlemanly character and to all appearance the mildest mannered man that ever sculled ship or cut a throat his looks are sad and melancholy and would indicate that he is either suffering from a cold in the head or that his outlaws had been a little more successful at all fours than himself the dejected heavier of his visage seems to touch the audience for they immediately give him several rounds of applause no doubt with the intention of raising his spirits this kind of manifestation of their feelings is responded to by one or two low bows and then he turns towards his outlaws to obtain a becoming reception from them he is greeted by his followers with the greatest enthusiasm though to their inquiries after his health he makes no reply but walks languidly down to the footlights and relates to both audience and outlaws how deplorable will be his condition unless he receive the assistance of the latter in carrying out his designs he goes on to state that the voice of a certain damsel of aragon has slid into his heart like dew upon a parched flower a simile which the reader will observe to be equally felicitous as novel he adds however that a great old villain and tyrant who of course must be the basso has carried off the spanish maiden and is about to compel her to marry him the bandits become at once highly indignant and with one accord seize their arms and declare that they will follow their chief to the castle of the old philogonist and bouvers all his designs by some insinuating digs of the poignard the despondent chief seems comforted by this assurance of their most distinguished consideration and remarks that the young lady will no doubt be a consoling angel amidst the griefs of exile while he has been informing the audience and his friends of the state of his feelings he has from time to time indulged in gestures about as strong as we can well conceive of but now and then when an extraordinarily deep sentiment and a very high note choose the same moment for their expression 
he is obliged to poise himself on one foot, extend the other behind him, elevating the heel and depressing the toe, fold his hands over his breast, throw back the head and shake his body like a Newfoundland dog just issuing from the water. The refractory note and the hidden emotion are always brought to light by these gesticulary expedients. Immediately after this, the scene having changed to the castle of the tyrant, the Aragonese Virginie, the prima donna, is discovered reclining on an old box covered with green blaze, which long continued acquaintance with theatrical properties enables the audience to recognize as a velvet lounge. The lady seems to be in great affliction, for which, however, we can discover no adequate cause, except that she is in such an unbecoming place for an unprotected female. The applause of the audience is overwhelming, and three very low, but extremely graceful and ladylike curtsies, which she rises to do, are the consequence. The bow are now in all the excitement that dandies dare permit themselves to yield to, alternately exclaiming, How grand she is! How beautiful! Heavens, but isn't she beautiful! And then bringing down the focus of the opera glass on the peerless woman. The distressed female now launches off into a recitative, in which she expresses, in no measured terms, her utter aversion to the hateful old tyrant, and then, falling on one knee, strikes into a cavatina, in which she says she hopes her lover, who necessarily must be the outlaw chief, who again must necessarily be the tenor, will come immediately and run off with her, a wish that is probably often entertained by young ladies in reference to their particular lovers, but which is seldom avowed in this public way. During the cavatina she has been doing some very high singing, and making a great many of the Newfoundland dog shakes, the lady part of the audience sitting in rapt attention, with the eyes fastened on the stage as intently as if they were witnessing a marriage ceremony, gently murmuring their approbation in detached sentences, such as, Sweet, lovely, charming, exquisite, while the fast men by the door utter the words, Knocker, fast nag, and declare that her time is two-thirty. One of these very sporting young gentlemen asserts his readiness to back her against the field. Just as the prima donna makes a very steep raise in the scale with a dreadful velocity of utterance, the same individual expresses his desire to withdraw the offer, observing that she is making her brushes too soon, and that he fears she'll be too distressed to come home handsome. A troop of maidens with very plethoric ankles now make their appearance, encumbered by large gilt pasteboard caskets containing some exceedingly brilliant paste jewellery, intended as bridal presents for the unprotected female. They have, however, the strangest mode of offering these tokens of friendship that we have ever seen. They arrange themselves in a line on one side of the stage, apparently measuring their proximity to or distance from the footlights with reference to the relative thickness of their ankles, until the lady nearest the audience seems to be the subject of a violent attack of elephantitis. This done, they repeatedly sing five bars, and stretch out the right hand containing the present, in a line, forming, with the body, an angle of about ninety degrees. A certain king of Castile in disguise, who is another of the many admirers of the heroine, breaks in on this little ceremony, expresses a strong wish to see her, and is told by one of the maidens that the subject of his admirations is very much depressed in spirits, being considerably smitten with the aforementioned outlaw chieftain. The king is shocked at his adored one's want of taste in making a preference so little flattering to himself, and endeavors to force her to escape with him. But the young lady, being highly indignant, draws a dagger and threatens to go into him, if he doesn't cease taking such liberties, thereby attracting considerable applause from some gentlemen in a back box, who have a strong penchant for dog-fighting. The outlaw happens to come in at the very nick of time, and after some quite serious altercation between him and the disguised king, at the moment when the fancy part of the audience are expecting a set to, and admiring the courage of the little tenor, the outlaw, which they technically denominate the game of the lightweight, the heroine rushes between them with a drawn sword, threatening to destroy herself if they do not desist, and calling upon them to remember the honour of her mansion, thereby, no doubt, alluding to the possibility of an indictment for keeping a disorderly house. 
the old tyrant of whom we have heard a great deal but have not as yet seen returns home late at night to his castle finding two unknown gentlemen in his house without an invitation conversing with his shut-up lady he charges them with the impropriety of their behaviour the strange gentleman the outlaw chief and the king in disguise not particularly relishing these observations beg him not to be so violent in his language this seems only to incense the old fellow the more who has just suggested coffee and pistols when the aforesaid king's followers entering make the tyrant acquainted with the fact that he's been blowing up a king the parasitical old tyrant immediately endeavours to excuse himself for the mistake he has made says he hopes his royal highness will not be offended and that he had not the pleasure of his acquaintance and all that sort of thing the king enjoins that he is perfectly excusable that no offence has been done that the cause of his own unlooked-for presence arises from the fact that he is out for the emperorship that he is about doing a little electioneering and that he just stopped in to learn the state of public feeling in his district and solicit his the tyrant's vote the tyrant being a good deal flattered by this appeal to his chief weak point namely his own fancied knowledge of party politics says that the king does him great honour supreme honour and invites him to spend the night in the castle which kind invitation his majesty graciously accepts in the meantime the outlaw having observed how much more cordially the tyrant is received than himself has made his exit the king's followers all draw up in line and conclude the act by a song the burden of which is that their master's nomination is the only one fit to be made the next act discovers the tyrant awaiting the arrival of the unfortunate heroine to whom he is going to be married in a few minutes all is jollity in the castle till a gentleman clothed as a pilgrim interrupts the general hilarity for when the bride enters he throws off the dreadful black cloak and reveals the outlaw chieftain he pitches himself into a variety of passionate attitudes to the great terror of a whole boarding-school of young ladies whom their teacher has permitted to visit the opera to improve their style of singing the bride-elect rushes up to him and so they both step down to the footlights the outlaw gentleman passes his right hand round the waist of the lady and clasps in his left both of hers elevating them to a line with the breast they remain stationary for a moment whilst the orchestra is playing the symphony looking as fondly into each other's eyes as a pair of dear little turtle doves and smiling as sweetly as every gentleman and lady have a right to smile under such pleasant circumstances there they begin to assure each other simultaneously of the pleasure they would find in immediately dying placed in the attitude which they are at present enjoying so highly by a rare and curious accident both repeating the same words with the exception of the respective substitution of the pronouns i you my your he she as often as such substitutions become necessary as if one should say for example all you'll bet my your money on the bobtail mare he'll she'll bet his her money on the bobtail mare the outlaw is however obliged to run and hide himself because he hears the king knocking to come in and he fears that he'll be killed if he is discovered the king enters and with a very fee fi fo fum air asks for the body of the outlaw the tyrant tells a most barefaced falsehood swears the outlaw is not in his house and so the king after considerable use of the word wretch traitor mendator etc carries off the bride as a hostage to the great chagrin of the tyrant as soon as the king has departed with his fair companion the tyrant runs to the outlaw's hiding-place and dragging him forth by the collar declares that he'll kill him himself the outlaw under great excitement seizes his head in both hands in a manner so terrible that self-decapitation would seem to be inevitable which so alarms the aforesaid boarding-school misses that two of them go off into hysterics and they are carried into the lobby where the cutting of their laces is attended with an explosion similar to that of popping a champagne cork the outlaw prays the tyrant not to kill him just now and says he will give him permission to do so at any future period here sir adds he still addressing himself to the tyrant is a very fine cornet piston allow me to present it to you with the assurance that whenever you wish to obtain my presence for the purpose of exterminating me you will merely be obliged to sound the note of b flat 
and I will unhesitatingly comply with your wishes. In the words of the poet Tennyson, Leave me here, and when you want me, sound upon the bugle-horn. The tyrant accepts the present upon the accompanying condition, but having no great confidence in the word of a man who has been associating so long a time with bad company, he requires him to make oath to that effect, which being done, both gentlemen call upon the chorus to follow them immediately in pursuit of the king and his captive lady. These cowardly rascals stand some five minutes and sing about their readiness to depart, instead of marching off instantly, as they are requested to do. In the third act, the king hides himself in a graveyard during the election for emperor, probably out of fear that he may be defeated. While wandering among the gravestones, he overhears some of his political enemies, among whom is the outlaw chieftain, plotting his assassination. The conspirators cast lots for the office of assassin, and the lot very naturally falls to the outlaw. The next moment the report of cannon is heard, and the king's retinue come in, bringing with them the heroine, who, we must confess, seems to have no real business there, and state that the polls have closed, and that the king has been elected emperor. Thereupon the new emperor calls the conspirators up, and is about to have them killed, just as it might be expected an emperor would do. The heroine begs for the life of the miserable offenders, telling the emperor that if he wishes to be considered a sovereign of respectability, and not conduct himself like one who had stolen a precious diadem and put it in his pocket, he must pardon the delinquents. The emperor relents, and pronounces a pardon for the conspirators. He calls up the robber chieftain and the heroine, and uniting their hands, expresses an ardent wish that they may, as the librato says, love for ever. The pleasure of the two lovers is indescribable, and the whole company begin to sing the praises of such a trump of an emperor. The air, which is chosen as the vehicle to carry all this adulation to royal ears, is apparently one of those crashing, clashing passages in the overture, and if the emperor does not hear the voice of flattery, it is because the gentlemen who preside over the kettle-drum and cymbals seem to have entered into a conspiracy to prevent it. The more zealous the chorus is in its efforts to make an agreeable impression on their sovereign, and the louder the voice is raised for this object, the more that irritable old drummer seems anxious to defeat their psychophantic purposes. If you are one of those excitable persons who are prone to take a side in every contest that comes under their observation, whether it be two gentlemen ranging for the presidency, or two bull terriers punishing each other for the possession of a bone, you immediately determine who you hope may carry their point. In your admiration of the dogged perseverance of the old drummer, you take part in favor of the instruments, and when you hear that sudden and awful clash of the cymbals, which causes you to start till you dig your elbow into an elderly gentleman on one side and tread on some corny toes on the other, you felicitate yourself upon the victory of parchment and brass over throats. But the next moment your pleasure is extinguished, for the tenor and soprano give their voices an extra lift, and away they go up like rockets, far aloft above the din of horns, cymbals, and kettle-drums. The fourth and last act represents the terrace of a highly illumined palace, which may be seen in the background. Some masked gentlemen, very bandy-legged and knock-kneed, dressed in tight hose, while calculated to exhibit these deformities, are observed flirting with some of the before-mentioned thick-ankled ladies, who likewise rejoice in dominoes. Everything indicates that this is a place where people are in the habit of being extremely jolly, and from which such stupid things as parties to which a few friends are invited very sociably, or family reunions, are entirely abolished. Presently, all the company break out with the expression of one general wish for the unbounded prosperity of the outlaw chief and the heroine whom we saw betrothed in the last act, and who have just been married. They make their exit shortly afterward in great precipitation, having been frightened from the stage by the appearance of a great, horrible-looking figure, clothed in black, which seems to be a species of bugbear, sent to scare such naughty people who do nothing but dance, sing, and make merry. The bugbear exits shortly after. Again the highly profligate chorus enter, in no wise corrected by the visitation of the gloomy-looking gentleman, and assure the audience what a pleasant thing it is for one man to flirt with another's wife from behind a mask, 
or for an innocent young lady going her first winter to whisper in a corner with a man about town but getting weary of this occupation they at last retire and the newly married couple the outlaw and his bride again show themselves the outlaw seems to be struck with a highly poetic vein for he tells the lady that the noise of the polka in the palace has ceased that the gas has been stopped off and that the stars are amusing themselves by smiling on their happy union because they've nothing else to do thereupon they indulge in a gentle embrace and start off simultaneously in a duo declaratory of the union of their two hearts in such an anti-anatomical manner that henceforth until their latest breath one cardiacal organ will suffice to perform the functions of two separate bodies scarcely have they made this declaration of their abnormal heart union before the sound of a horn falls on the ears of the o'er happy couple at this moment the outlaw forgets all good breeding and still influenced by his former brigand habits swears a most horrible oath in the presence of his young bride and seems to be overcome by a great depression of spirits the poor woman observing nothing singular about the blast of the horn in all probability fancying that it is only the tooting of a lazy post-boy somewhere behind time prays him to cheer up and let her see him smile before the outlaw can comply with this small request the horn sounds again behold shrieks the young husband the tiger seeks his prey the bride surveys the apartment but observing no tiger or other ferocious animal takes it for granted that he has the mania apotu induced by imbibing too much champagne at the wedding feast she immediately runs out into the bridal chamber with the intention of putting on those indefinite garments denominated things and going to call up the court physician the outlaw chieftain stands a moment listening with breathless attention and hearing no more of the horn comes to the conclusion that he has no just ground for fear and that it was only a dreadful ringing in the ears with which he is sometimes afflicted he thereupon rushes in pursuit of his bride but just as he arrives at the door of the bridal chamber his progress is arrested by the same black hobgoblin gentleman who frightened the dissipated chorus as before related this gentleman is recognized by the outlaw in spite of his black clothes and mask as the hateful old tyrant who persecuted him to such an extent some time previously the outlaw groans a few times and then the tyrant asks his victim if he calls to mind his promise and the words of the poet tennyson leave me here and when you want me sound upon the bugle-horn the poor outlaw begs for his life but the old tyrant remains inexorable and tells him that he must die the unhappy bride returns and hearing her husband entreating the old tyrant so fervently for a respite unites her supplications with those of her husband to this the tyrant makes no direct answer but merely presents a poignard to the trembling outlaw with a repetition of the words of the poet tennyson leave me here and when you want me sound upon the bugle-horn the outlaw perceiving no mode of escape from this horn of the dilemma seizes the poignard drives it in his breast and sinks mortally wounded the poor bride shrieks and falls upon his body now succeeds a scene of pulling and dragging on the floor the wounded tenor is called upon to struggle and writhe in all the agonies of death and the prima donna to follow him up in order to raise his head on her knee and thus give him an opportunity of singing his dying solo to do this in such a manner as not to render the whole thing ridiculous and farcical instead of tragic and touching requires all the grace and ease imaginable when well done it is impressive when badly it is laughable but whether touching or laughable it is sure to be relished by a large part of the audience for it always discloses who has done most for the prima donna's bust dame nature or the mantua maker the tenor's head being elevated to the proper height he expresses it as his dying wish that the prima donna will continue to live and cherish his memory then they lament their unhappy fate in a short duo the tenor dies the prima donna appears to do the same but the libretto consoles you by declaring that she only swoons the old tyrant the basso chuckles like a wretch over the success of his successful plot declares it a revenge worthy of a demon you concur in his sentiments and the curtain falls gentle reader are you wearied out with this insufferable nonsense do not say that you are or you will have established a reputation for want of taste beyond all controversy not to admire what we have written in this chapter 
is to condemn what we know you have often declared was a love of an opera. We have merely explained the plot of a well-known operatic chef d'oeuvre, which, goodness knows, required an explanation. Now, do not be petulant, and very satirically exclaim, I wish he would explain his explanation, thereby showing, both that you can be excessively severe, and that you have read Byron. We do not intend to endeavour to render luminous that which is so very clear and evident in its meaning. It would be to gild refined gold, and all that sort of thing, and therefore we spare you the infliction. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Physiology of the Opera by Screechy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Nine. I'm fond of fire and crickets and all that, a lobster salad and champagne and chat. Byron. From this genteel place, the reader must not be surprised if I should convey him to a cellar or a common porterhouse. Connoisseur number one. Sweet is old wine in bottles, ale in barrels. Byron The curtain falls, much to the delight of those gentlemen whose sole motive for frequenting the opera is to have an opportunity of what they call chaffing with some fair lady friend, whilst repairing thither, and returning from thence, as well as during the enchanting moments when the drop displays one of those accommodating landscapes which the audience, at their option, may convert either into the lake of Como or the ruins of Palmyra. If we may trust the assertion of many fair mouths, we must infer that the curtain has fallen, much to the regret of certain young ladies, who declare that they could sit and hear Bossio for ever, a period of time which we have always been taught to regard as very long indeed. But the curtain has fallen, and the gentlemen who have been foolish enough to send bouquets to the prima donna in the morning all seem suddenly to be struck with the bright idea that by giving a few knocks of a cane or a few taps of a gloved hand they can call out that divine woman, and by some adroit manoeuvre render themselves distinguishable and obvious to her from out that mass of heads and black coats. The persons who occupy the elevated portions of the house, who have paid a small price for their admittance, like all other persons who pay small prices, make large demands for their money and consequently unite with the prima donna's admirers in an attempt to get a last, long, lingering look at the lady. They really do all the applause, thundering with their heavy canes and beating their hands together until they resemble small lumps of crude beefsteaks. After the requisite amount of delay which is imposed upon the audience to give them an adequate idea of the obligation the prima donna will confer, should she see fit to exhibit herself, a human head is seen to project from behind the curtain, but is drawn back with that kind of jerk which is said to be peculiar to a turtle, establishing his right to the homestead exemption. This little aglion of the prompter has the desired effect, for the gentlemen in the parquet, who expect the prima donna to observe them to the entire exclusion of the other five hundred men in white cravats and black coats, become perfectly fanatic and the sojourners in paradise threaten to take advantage of their position and empty themselves on the heads of the higher orders of society who happen for the present to be below them. The excitement now begins to infuse itself into all present. The most apathetic old habitués commence to stretch forth their necks, to wriggle in their seats, and to manifest other signs of sympathy with the more inflammable portion of the audience. At length the tenor comes forward from the side of the curtain, with a sickly smile of inexpressible pleasure on his countenance. He leads by the hand the prima donna, whose downcast eyes and modest demeanour entirely mislead the audience, giving them the fullest assurance of her beautiful disposition, and wholly contradicting the assertion that she ever stamps her foot at the leader, or tears the hair of her maid. The brace of singers make one acknowledgment of gratitude immediately after issuing from behind the ruins of Palmyra, thence proceeding in front of said ruins make another and the moment before their disappearance perpetrate a third this is not sufficient for those enamoured ones who think that by some evident mistake the prima donna has not recognised them so the padding of gloves and the tapping of canes is again resorted to which together with the efforts of the upper circles 
again extracts the tenor and his inamorata together with the drowsy basso the last named person wears an air of great reluctance at thus being detained on the stage instead of being permitted to go home to his pates and fricassees the three go through the reverential with due regard to time and position and then withdraw leaving the house to contemplate the gaslight and reflect upon the briefness of all human pleasures during all this time the ladies have been standing in an apparently half decided state as to what was ultimately to become of them alternately looking on the stage and picking up hoods and shawls which they immediately let fall again now that their suspense is ended they commence to hood and shawl and many is the gentleman who announces in whispers that he is unspeakably happy in being permitted to place a cloak upon the shoulders that rival alabaster harry brown is unfortunate for miss smith's cousin george has anticipated him having already astutely seized upon a shawl during the calling out which he carefully keeps until the blissful moment arrives for enveloping that lady miss smith thanks cousin george as she always calls him with such a sweet smile that harry brown immediately becomes occupied in a protracted search after his hat muttering to himself hang these cousins the audience go out of the boxes together with the going out of the gas and masses of people stand crowded together in the lobbies while the house is slowly emptying itself the fast men have collected about in front of the different box doors from which the ladies are issuing and are examining the relative claims to beauty which the fair observed ones merit or as they term it are getting their points they are heard to make their comparisons upon the singers too with all the assurance of the old habitues telling about salvi's falsetto and bettini's just voice with a wondrous deal of volubility where the crowds from the upper tiers unite with those of the lower one loud-voiced critic who has just made his descent is heard to observe to a friend that though salvi is an old cock he is nevertheless a remarkably sound egg but why such a peculiarly gallinaceous reference is made to that distinguished tenor we must unhesitatingly confess ignorance after the confusion attendant on the coming and going of carriages cabs and divers other vehicles the fatigued audience are at length set in motion toward their respective dwellings again poor harry brown is a fit subject for our commiseration the ill-fated young man is placed by the side of miss smith's mother a rather antique lady cousin george somehow or other has managed to place himself beside miss smith the carriage passes a lamp-post and though harry brown does observe cousin george's left hand the disappearance of the right is something for which he cannot at all account except upon the laws of proximity which pertain to cousinship while the carriage proceeds homeward the party does not converse as freely as they did a short time before under the exhilaration arising from the gas light and gossip harry brown finds the ride a bore mrs smith is so deaf and still has her ideas of public amusement confined to the times when mr kemble mr cooper and mr cook performed in the legitimate drama to crowded houses cousin george's position is such a happy one that conversation is to him a thing superfluous those whose means authorize them and very often those whose means do not authorize them go home to a nice supper some delicate partridges cold capon or deviled turkey and a bottle or two of champagne under the influences of the warm room and the viands not to mention that warmy champagny old particular brandy punchy feeling induced by the popping cork the events of the whole evening are reviewed in a quite thorough manner though without much attention to a lucidus ordo let us follow the smiths home and see what is their mode of terminating the evening scarcely have they settled themselves at table before a glass of champagne is administered all around and a very severe criticism of basio is commenced by cousin george who says in a very opinionated way that he likes her pretty well but prefers either truffi or stefanoni miss smith immediately espouses the cause of the injured basio whom she has often declared she could listen to for ever and calls on harry brown to come to the rescue of the cantatrice's reputation harry who has been sadly silent ever since the miraculous disappearance of cousin george's right hand in the carriage at once becomes a violent basioite and maintains the vocal abilities of that prima donna against the whole world whereupon miss smith 
with one of the most approving of smiles, exclaims, "'Thank you, Mr. Brown. I always knew you were a gentleman of taste. There, there, let me shake hands with you.' And as Miss Smith utters the last words, she extends such a ridiculously little hand across the table that it seems almost a misnomer to apply that appellation to it. Mr. Brown seizes the proffered member, and gives it as hearty a pressure as the publicity of the occasion will permit. From the moment that he touches the magical little hand, Cousin George is eclipsed. Harry's knowledge of operas, music and singers, becomes at once astonishingly enlarged, and he speaks on operatic subjects like one having authority to do so. Fortunately for Cousin George, Miss Smith's brother Charles enters, his clothes strongly redolent of Havana's, he having just returned from his club. His sister forbids him to come so near her, alleging as a ground for such a prohibition that those horrid cigars are so offensive to her. Her brother moves good-naturally to the other side of the table, having first applied his finger to his sister's cheek in a playful way, which has a powerful effect upon poor Harry, causing him to feel exceedingly as if he should like to do the same thing himself. The sister begins to assure her brother of the inestimable amount of pleasure he has lost by loitering at the horrid club, instead of accompanying her to the delicious opera. The reply is that the club has voted Bossio a bore, and that consequently he cannot think of wasting his valuable time by going to hear her. The sister then makes some very severe remarks upon clubs in the abstract, but is interrupted by her brother's inquiring if she does not want to take a share in the great stakes which the club is endeavouring to raise, in order to pit tom hyler against harry broom the english champion the sister pretends to be so provoked at the raillery of her brother that she smiles in a way that makes her look doubly pretty calls him a horrid creature then turns to harry brown and indulges in some rather pointed observations relative to divers of the good people who were among the audience at the opera mrs smith who has up to this moment been very laudably occupied in seeing that the young people get a due proportion of the well-selected viands, now comes in for a part of the conversation. She, good lady, knows the fathers and grandfathers, mothers and grandmothers, of the present generation, and can tell just what amount of homage each of the dashing families of the city have a right to lay claim to. She declares that Mrs. Sims has no right to assume the importance that she does, that though her father was a very respectable man, still, when she was a girl, the family lived in a very obscure part of the town, and were wholly unknown among our first people. Miss Smith, however, who is very much afraid that her mother is going to indulge in too minute and wearisome an investigation of genealogies, conducts the conversation to subjects which she supposes to be more interesting to the rest of the party. She objects to the want of taste, displayed by those awful-looking Mrs. Rogers, who deck themselves out like young girls, when everybody knows they have been in society for the last fifteen years, that their mother has made herself notorious, as well as ridiculous, by angling for every young man of desirable means in the city. Miss Smith likewise expresses her wonder, when that stupid Lieutenant Jones will marry Miss Sims. She declares that she is tired of seeing the two together, that one cannot go into any public place, but the first persons who meet the eye are Jones and Miss Sims, that if the weather is fair and you walk out, there are the loving couple in the street. Go to Newport, there they are. Go to the opera, there they are. If they can find means to run incessantly to parties and balls, watering places and operas, why cannot they get married? Miss Smith concludes her observations on the overfond lovers by emphasizing the words, so stupid, is it not, at the same time giving them both an affirmative and interrogative character. Harry Brown responds that it might be excessively uninteresting to be always thus placed in proximity to Miss Sims, but that there are other young ladies of his acquaintance with whom such extreme intimacy would be anything but stupid. To this ambiguous use of the word stupid, Miss Smith makes no reply, but merely looks at Mr. Brown, as if she had not the slightest idea whether that very personal allusion to herself had been made by that gentleman. Miss Smith again indulges in reflections on society with a great deal of freedom and pointedness of expression, which much amuses Cousin George, who laughs approvingly at what he terms the sharpness of his relative. Brother Charles remains wholly unattentive to a kind of conversation which his fair sister so often takes part in, 
and is absorbed in estimating on the back of a visiting card the probability of his winning his bet on the late election harry brown after his complimentary effort sinks into a state of silence induced by the loquacity of miss smith the hilarity of cousin george and the negligence of brother charles alas for harry he is considering the likelihood that such a censorious young lady can have a kind heart or would make a good wife at this moment mr smith senior walks into the dining-room a worthy respectable and well-to-do man is mr smith the elder he pays his taxes and he loves his children and who can do more miss smith immediately rises from the table puts up her dear little mouth to her papa to be kissed the tender parent goes through the osculatory process in such an affectionate manner that harry brown is strongly impressed with the idea that the old gentleman would make a trump of a father-in-law and he begins to suspect that miss smith's heart is not so bad after all the elderly smith takes his seat having first shaken harry by the hand in a friendly familiar way that indicates a very good opinion of that worthy young person the conversation again reverts to operatics but harry seems to have forgotten all his late familiarity with such subjects and becomes suddenly very conversant with railroads canals and stocks and launches out into an earnest conversation with mr smith on those interesting topics but everything must have an end so about midnight mr brown walks home through a foot of snow because his mind is too much occupied with the thoughts of miss smith and her cousin george to allow him to think of calling a cab let us now see what becomes of those gentlemen who have been sitting in the parquet giving the opera their most anxious attention at all such times as either the prima donna is on stage or any aria is sung but who have been giving quite unmistakable signs of ennui and weariness during the recitatives and choruses if we have narrowly observed the movements of this portion of the audience we will have remarked that during the performance of the last act they have from time to time cast hurried glances towards the avenues of egress and contorted their countenances in a way which would indicate that their olfactories were greeted by certain savoury odours imperceptible to everybody but the possessors of the said olfactories these gentlemen immediately after leaving the opera may be seen to walk along the street in companies of three or four with a hurried step until their progress is arrested by a view of the divers green blue pink or crimson coloured lamps holding a very conspicuous position over the doors of some houses of very suggestive exterior or before some suspicious hiatus on the pavement where those horrid monsters who figure in christmas pantomimes might easily be imagined to dwell these lamps seem to be possessed of a most incredible power of human attraction for no sooner does their light fall upon the vision of the nocturnal wayfarer than he is drawn within the portals over which they are established upon mounting the steps into these houses or descending into these subterranean regions the inquirer will discover a long brilliantly illuminated gaudily papered chamber whose walls are ornamented with numerous overgrown mirrors and french-coloured prints representing young ladies in short dresses standing in every possible posture except that usually assumed by ladies of our acquaintance along one side of this apartment at some distance of about three and a half feet from the wall extends a marble slab placed in a horizontal position and elevated three feet from the floor forming a species of enclosure within this enclosure a number of men habited to the waist in white garments apparently of a nameless order of priesthood are going through some inexplicable mystic rites repeatedly seizing up various large glass bottles containing transparent or opaque liquids and carrying them to different parts of this marble slab at the request of various persons who seem to be the worshippers in this temple at one end of the enclosure a solitary man of a dark and sombre hue evidently a person held more sacred than the other priests is seen alternately to hammer portions of some hard matter resembling stone in appearance and then split them by the magical application of a small piece of blunt iron he conducts this ceremony with the greatest solemnity occasionally pronouncing these incantatory words a plate or shell sa in a seemingly interrogative manner the worshippers at these shrines are some of the same young gentlemen whom we have seen standing back in the opera boxes by the doors making fast remarks on all that was passing around them or sitting in the parquet endeavouring to annihilate the prima donna by the attractiveness of their appearance others of the same class of persons 
merely pass through this chamber, having first said in a low tone to the most potential of the priests, four dozen broiled, ale for one, and brandy and water for three. The priest immediately repeats these words so fraught with significance, in a loud voice, which resounds to the whole chamber. An invisible priest, at some distance from the first, again repeats them, and thus the mysterious sound is passed from one unseen priest to another, until it ceases to be heard in the distance. Nothing more is seen of the last described devotees for some time after their leaving the mysterious apartment. But about midnight a confused sound of human voices is heard to issue from another mysterious chamber. Some of those voices express a dogged determination on the part of their proprietors to remain shut up within the present confines until the matutinal hours. Other voices assure a universal confidence in the powers of a certain bobtail mare, while one teaches in the Italian language the secret of living happily. Footnote. Il segreto per esser felici. End of footnote. At between two and three o'clock in the morning, several of our operators are seen to emerge from the aforesaid houses and subterranean abodes in a very musical, as well as affectionate, frame of mind. One gentleman, totally regardless of the lateness of the hour, after manifesting a strong desire to embrace a large party of his friends, kindly invites them home to take tea with him. Another walks homeward, expressing his notions on the secret of living happily in a cantatory way. A third is assisted into a cab by his associates, with directions to the driver to set him down at his lodgings. Arrived there, he is put to bed, when he dreams that he is falling down five hundred precipices, that afterwards a huge man is on the point of cutting off his head, but a very prima donna-like looking lady comes in and intercedes for him, and she thus saves his life, that he is just going to be married to the prima donna-like looking lady, when his pleasure is interrupted by the sound of ten thousand horns, each one four times as large as that he saw the tyrant have in the opera, whereupon he awakes and discovers that there is a cry of fire, and the firemen are making almost as much noise as the orchestra did when it was doing the crashing passages. In the morning the chambermaid wonders why Mr. Higgins rings for water when she recollects filling the ewer full the previous night. Next day, Mr. Higgins examines his operatic accounts and finds them to stand thus. To one pair of kid gloves, one dollar. To opera ticket, secured seat, one dollar fifty. To supper, three dollars. To cab hire, one dollar. Total, six dollars fifty. At that moment his landlady sends in the bill for lodging, which, by the by, she always seems to do when he is in one of his repentant moods, and Mr. Higgins expresses a kind wish that all Italians were in a climate somewhat warmer than that of the south of Europe. The Smiths do not feel any inconvenience, physical or pecuniary, from their visit to the opera, and petit super afterwards. When one has money, says Mrs. Smith, in a very oracular tone, what is the use of it, except to let people know that one has got it? Immediately after this expression of her sentiments in regard to filthy lucre, Mrs. Smith tells the servant not to give a shilling to the whimpering little boy who's been sweeping the snow off the pavement, that sixpence is enough, and more than enough, for him, and that it is wrong to encourage such exorbitance. Now, that Mr. Higgins should feel thirsty in the morning, or that Mrs. Smith should regret to part with the sixpence, concerns not us. We have not been writing to correct public morals, but only to amuse the readers of the physiology of the opera. End of chapter 9 and End of Physiology of the Opera by John H. Swaby, a.k.a. Screechy.